I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. We have a great show for you tonight. More on the walkout in Salem, EBT cards, and Washington's drug law problem. But first, you know what? We're going to switch things up. We often start out with big problems in an effort to hold politicians and others accountable and maybe offer suggestions. But you know what? There's more to life than conflict and outrage. So let's talk about libraries. I love libraries. Albert Einstein once said the only thing that you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. Now, you may know where your local library is, but we're going to tell you about one that you probably missed. And this one is worth the trip, if only to meet its one of a kind librarian. Laurel Porter has our story. In the tiny community of Grand Ronde, Oregon, right off Highway 18, few of the cars heading to Lincoln City, Pacific City, or the casino notice the unassuming old Grand Ronde Bank building. It closed long ago. <laughs> it's where memories live. Fewer people still know <laughs> what replaced it. The library, the time for God. Something that gives new meaning to the phrase banking hours. And now go open up the library door. And they probably don't see 80-year-old Amelie Redman dutifully open the doors, rain, snow or shine, once a week, only on... Monday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have a flag. Try to open by noon on your mark. <laughs> but Amelie is here long before that. Uh, I take about three to start with. This former bank vault has no cold cash and no heat. Uh, hello, I'm building a fire and I come early. <laughs> All right. No phone, no computer. Amelie has replaced the bank teller. Yeah. Uh, and what was once a depository of banknotes now holds other treasures. Thomas B. Costain. And to think that grandma and grandpa had those books as children. Yeah. Riches of books. Novels, alphabetical, the A's start up by the street and it comes around back here and over here and a little bit around the other side. Yeah, that's these. Horror, the romance. My romance days, that was uh, Look to the Mountain. Sci-fi and fantasy. They're all donated, yes, truly, truly. A library time forgot. This is Zane Gray. Founded by the Grand Ronde Women's Club in 1958. There's always something to be learned. It was once the only library oh, around. It's not connected to the Confederated Tribes of Grand mm. Ronde, which now has its own library up the road. Yes. This is the, the book where we write down the patrons' names. It's the original spiral notebook, as far as I can tell. About 3,500 names in all. Francis Mercier. Willamina school kids checked out some of the first books. Pond. I went to school with the Ponds. Glenda Morgan. I have the Bailey Bailey Baker. Amelie's mom checked out books too. Oh, 727. Bernice J. Rydell. That's my mom. Yep, that's me. And of course, Amelie. Oh, there's where I signed in. 3365, Elsie. Elsie signed me and that's her handwriting. Yeah. Elsie was the original librarian. When she passed away, I started coming here and being the librarian. That was 2013. And she's been here every Monday since. Yeah. Oh, yeah. except for one. This was Eclipse. I closed on the Eclipse day so I could go watch the Eclipse. There's no card catalog. No radio, no TV. And many times, yeah, no patrons. It's amazing how you can hide in plain sight. Put out an open sign. Maybe if I put out a sign, free counseling, I'd get more people. But don't call her a lonely librarian. You're engaged with the world when you're reading. And even when no one else is here, she always has company. Yes, look at all the free books I get to read. I haven't read them all yet. The fiery fingers. Oh, man. And keeping this Thank hidden you. in plain sight little library open yeah. has become Amelie's calling. 
It's keeping the spirit of learning. And on average, uh, once a week. Yeah, somebody. Uh, who is that? Hey. Someone to share it with. Usually I get somebody. A couple people every week, yeah. Travis Dow moved to the area a couple of years ago. So I drove by it, going to the post office and going to the store. And I was like, this is, you know, it's an old bank building turned into a library. And so my curiosity was, I am a reader. I'm a nerd. It's history. It's good stuff. And this time, <laughs> Travis brought his sister Frankie oh, yes. from Dallas, Oregon. <laughs> the crawdads thing. They, they just made a show on that on Netflix. Yes. Eminent artists. It's from uh, like 1964 and 83. So about every 20 years it gets checked out. My number was 3,500. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have yeah. to look and see if I wrote it in, in your last check. Bye. For Amelie, it's what keeps her coming back. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Monday after Monday after Monday. I haven't been replaced yet. Oh, poo. As library hours come to a close. He's here for more than four hours generally. But the first librarian, Elsie's son, Dennis Worth, arrives. Oh, well. He keeps the library funded in his mom's memory. That's partly true, I suppose. Together, and Dennis and Amelie close the book on another week. We're uh, on our way out the door. For the little library waiting to be discovered. You got it. Off Highway 18. <laughs> standing as a quiet legacy that speaks volumes. The little library that could. <laughs> and I want to thank our amazing KGW photojournalist, Kurt Austin, who shot that story. Now remember, Amelie's only open Mondays from noon to four. There is no phone, so you can't call her. There's no computer, you can't email, no website. But if you want to get a hold of her, Pat, I guess you could leave a note at the front door. <laughs> and we that. have directions to the library on our website, kgw.com. Well, I love that story. And I love her. What an interesting life she must have had. She did so many things. She was a Forest Service lookout. Talk about lonely. She was a VISTA volunteer. She worked for the state of Alaska for a school district. She also wanted to run for governor well, in Oregon. That's right. <laughs> it was 1984 though, so it wasn't an election year, so, so that didn't happen. She also ran a recycling center about which she wrote a song and played it for us on her guitar, and we put that on our website too, so be sure to check that. It was oh really cute. Oh my gosh, it's all amazing. And she doesn't have a phone or computer at the library. What about at home? At home, she doesn't have a computer. She doesn't have a cell phone. She does have a landline, <laughs> and so she's kind of hard to get a hold of. When I finally did to tell her the story was running tonight, she said, hmm, I don't have a television. I'll have to find somebody. So Amelie, I hope you found somebody with a television and I hope you're watching. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And thank you for sharing her story. That was beautiful. My pleasure. <laughs> Moving on, every year hundreds of thousands of students across Oregon rely on their schools for food, primarily free and reduced price lunch and breakfast. And those kids were put in a tough spot when schools closed during the COVID-19 pandemic. A number of efforts popped up to try and get meals to the students when the schools were closed down. And later, Oregon's Department of Human Services sent out EBT food cards to families to help out. Only the rollout had a big mistake. And two years later, DHS made the same mistake again. Thousands of families who were not eligible for the EBT cards got them anyway. Here's what happened. DHS was supposed to send those cards to families who have kids. Each kid would get $391. The kids were eligible for the cards if they themselves were eligible for free or reduced price lunch, or if they were under six and got SNAP benefits. They could also have been eligible if they went to what's called a community eligibility provision school. Those are high poverty schools where more than 40% of the students are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. So the entire school gets that. That is important to remember for later on. But last month, DHS sent those EBT cards to students who were not eligible, about 3,700 of them. That's about $1.46 million that they should not have sent out. Now, DHS says they've recovered about $1.32 million, which means all told they're out about $140,000 in taxpayer money. DH says, if someone got a card by mistake and spent any of the money on it, they won't have to pay any of it back and they can use the rest of the balance on the card. DHS will not try to get it back. 
But for people who had not spent any of the money, DHS was able to go in and clear out the balance on those cards. They no longer have any money on them. So here's the thing. DHS made the exact same mistake in the exact same way two years ago. In that case, they sent out a lot more money, $7.8 million on EBT cards to about 5,800 students who, again, were not eligible for them. This happened in November of 2021. They were able to recover about $5 million of that money. So how did it happen twice? DHS tells us their contractor, a company called Deloitte, mistakenly designated schools as community eligibility provision schools. Remember, those are the schools where every student gets free lunch because the eligibility number is so high. Well, Deloitte's automated process designated several schools as CEP when they were not. So everyone at those schools got those EBT cards. Now, apparently they didn't learn the first time because Deloitte did the same thing in this case. So we asked DHS if they continue to plan to contract with Deloitte after two mistakes. They didn't really answer our question, but they did tell us that they're working with the contractor to figure out how it happened again and how to prevent it in the future. Let's hope so. Up next on the story, the Republican walkout in the Oregon Senate continues and the GOP sticking to their talking point that this is about the readability of several bill summaries. And if that sounds a bit flimsy, well, it's because it is. We're putting some Republican bills to the test and we got our first hint that the narrative could be changing when the story returns. Well, today, Republicans in the Oregon Senate continued their walkout, now in its sixth day. Legally, the Senate there cannot conduct any business because they don't have enough senators and they don't have what's called a quorum. So as the House continues to work on bills, the Senate is stalled, stopped dead in its tracks. Senate President Rob Wagner held sessions over the weekend, but to no avail, although it did mean that some Senate Republicans racked up more unexcused absences, putting them closer to that magic number of 10. By my count, several Republican senators have five or more unexcused absences. If a lawmaker has 10 or more, 
Then in a single session, they're not, they are disqualified from running for re-election following the end of their current term. So it's kind of a big deal. That's thanks to Measure 113, which voters in Oregon passed by a big margin back in November. Now, there's been talk recently among some Republican leaders that some members may actually hit that 10 absence in order to test the constitutionality of Measure 113. But we'll have to wait and see on that one. That brings us, though, to the reason for the walkout in the first place. Democrats continue to say it's all because the GOP does not want a number of bills to go through that have already passed the House. And because Democrats have the majority in the Senate, the GOP really has no way to stop those bills unless they don't show up for work. So that is what they're doing. But the Republicans spent much of last week insisting that it had really nothing to do with the bills themselves. They argue instead it's about Senate rules and a state law that require bill summaries to be written in a way that any eighth grader could understand, which in theory is not a bad hill to stand on, except for the fact that the bills the Republicans are also pushing do not follow that law either. Which brings us to this exchange from Friday between KGW's Tim Gordon and Deputy Republican Leader Lynn Findlay of Eastern Oregon. People are saying, look, they're bringing this up right when they don't yeah. want to deal with these bills. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely perception, but it's not the case. You know, absolutely the case is let's comply with the darn law. All right, so let's comply with the darn law, shall we, Senator Findlay? Here's what state law says. ORS 171.134 passed back in 1979. The title is Readability Test for Legislative Digests and Summaries. Any measure digest or measure summary prepared by the Legislative Assembly shall be written in a manner that results in a score of at least 60 on the flesh readability test or meets an equivalent standard of a comparable test. Senator Lynn Findlay is a chief sponsor of nearly 100 bills in the Oregon legislature this session. We randomly chose five of them on various topics to see if the bill summary passes the law that the senator is so adamant that others follow. Let's start with Senate Bill 45, which would create a task force for tax competitiveness. We copy the bill summary listed on the legislature's website and plug it into a flesh readability calculator. Remember, the law says it has to score 60 or above and this one scored 27.5. Fail. Absolutely, the case is, let's comply with the darn law. Well, how about Senate Bill 57? That's an agricultural bill concerning the sale of female cattle that don't have a certain vaccination. Grab the summary, throw it in the calculator, 31.2. Fail. Absolutely, the case is, let's comply with the darn law. How about Senate Bill 127, which concerns the corporate activity tax? Plug the summary into the flesh calculator, 43.7. Well, it's closer, but it's still a fail. Let's comply with the darn law. Perhaps a bill that began over on the House side would fare better for the senator, where he is one of the chief sponsors for HB 2417. This one is about disorderly conduct involving a family member. Plug in the summary, 37. Well, that's still not quite 60. Another fail. That's absolutely perception, but it's not the case. You know, absolutely the case is, let's comply with the darn law. And finally, how about House Bill 3068? This one has to do with high school diplomas. The summary goes into the calculator and this one scored a 14. At last check, that's less than 60. Let's comply with the darn law. <laughs> All right, listen, remember, we're not on anybody's team, but come on, man. By the way, we emailed Senator Finley's office today asking for a statement about many of his bills failing that readability test. A policy analyst responded to us and said the senator is out of the office and unavailable and pointed us to the communications director for the Senate Republicans. But you get the point. Making this about readability law, it's nonsense. And because that argument is so easily exposed, it does appear that the Senate Minority Leader Tim Kinnock might be starting to change the narrative. An article by Julia Shumway in the Oregon Capitol Chronicle says that during a phone call with Kinnock yesterday, he said the Republicans are protesting around 20 different bills that they call hyperpartisan, including the measures on abortion, transgender health care and guns. Kinnock told Shumway if Democrats set those bills to the side and have the bill summaries fixed on other bills, Republicans will come back. I would venture to guess there's about 0% chance of the Democrats doing that. So for now, 
will remain in the legislative standoff in the Senate. And if you've lived in Oregon for a few years, you may be thinking, oh my, this walkout business is familiar. And that's because, yes, it is. Republicans did the same thing in 2019 and 2020 over carbon cap and trade legislation. In those years, Democrats did end up setting the bills aside in order to get the GOP back to Salem. Although Governor Kate Brown later used her executive powers to institute cap and trade anyway. And this year's session also has one massive piece of unfinished business. It's the budget. So it's really a question of who's going to give first. Democrats have the high ground. They're urging Republicans just come on, get back to work. But the GOP is in desperation mode, doing perhaps the only thing that they can to stop the bills that they do fundamentally disagree with. So which side makes concessions? This year's session lasts until June 25th and the clock is ticking. Meanwhile, the legislative session in Olympia is already wrapped up. It happened at the end of last month. There were not any walkouts, but lawmakers did fail to pass a new drug possession law. And without a new law, drug possession is slated to become legal in the state of Washington on July 1st. That's because a temporary fix will soon expire. We're going to break down how we got here and tell you what's next in Washington when the story returns. Straight ahead at 6.30, a candidate for the Portland School Board who said last week he was dropping out of the race has apparently changed his mind. We'll sort out the confusion and the controversy behind it. Plus, a historic Southeast Portland restaurant being renovated into a community center becomes a magnet for homeless people. Why the property's owners say things got out of control. And Portland football officials are looking for a few good refs. Why they're facing a shortage and how you can help keep Friday night lights on Fridays this fall. That's next at 6.30. We hope to see you then. Do you have a Roku or an Amazon Fire? If you do, you can watch today's show, plus previous shows and segments anytime on our streaming service. Add KGW Plus to your home screen and be sure to check it often for segments and shows that you may have missed. On to Washington State now, where lawmakers adjourned their regular session back on April 23rd. But they'll be back in Olympia next week after Governor Jay Inslee called a special session. It begins on May 16th, and the focus is on passing a new drug possession law. That happens after lawmakers failed to do so over the past couple of months. So how did Washington get to a place where drug possession could soon be legalized? Sebastian Robertson with our sister station in Seattle explains.
In part, the state's long and complex drug law history dates back to 2016. That's when law enforcement in Spokane arrest Shannon Blake, who's found to have a small amount of meth in her pocket. She's charged with possession of a controlled substance. Her attorneys argue she didn't know she had the drugs on her and take the case all the way to the state Supreme Court. In February of 2021, in what's now called the Blake decision, the state vacated the woman's conviction, saying the Constitution bars the legislature from penalizing her conduct without requiring the state to prove she had a guilty mind. In other words, prosecutors never had to prove that the suspect knew she was carrying drugs. So as you can see, all that foil he's picking up right now is from fentanyl use. The Blake decision reversed the current state law, making the felony drug possession law unconstitutional. Thousands of pending drug cases are dropped. We're going to see people get out without infrastructure in place in order to get them the help they need. Word gets out. Everybody thinks drugs are legal now, so they can do drugs wherever they want. In 2021, SB 5476 passed as a temporary fix. Hey, it's the police. It made drug possession a misdemeanor and requires law enforcement to issue at least two treatment referrals before charging. Within the last year, municipalities across the state introduced their own city ordinances intended at stopping public drug use. However, local governments can't criminalize possession since state law supersedes local law. We're not trying to arrest our way out of a drug epidemic, but we do know that when people are in our criminal justice system, it gives them an incentive to want to get better. All this could change come July of 2023. That's when that temporary fix passed by lawmakers is set to expire. That's unless lawmakers in this newly called special session pass a new law criminalizing drug possession in the state of Washington. Well, that'll be interesting to watch. Special sessions are meant to last 30 days, but Governor Inslee says it could finish long before that if lawmakers can work out a deal. Well, that's the end of our show. Thanks for watching. Remember the story, our story? That never ends. Be sure to tune in at 6 o'clock on Thursday, by the way, for a special show that we're going to do where we'll talk about the perception of downtown Portland. You don't want to miss that. In the meantime, stick around for the news at 630, and I'll see you tomorrow.